Good evening, everyone, and welcome. My name is Marion, and I'm part of the programs team here at Hornsby Library. I acknowledge that wherever we are in Australia, we stand on the traditional lands of Aboriginal people. I recognise the traditional custodians of these lands and the continuing connection to land, culture, community and story. I pay my respects to Elders past, present and emerging. Here at Hornsby, we are on the lands of the Darug and Garingai peoples, and I invite you to recognise the custodians of the country you are on. Our event this evening is Branding Your Business, and we're pleased to have Nick Belshaw joining us from Canva. Canva is an easy to use online design tool, which allows users to create a range of professional designs. In tonight's workshop, you will be getting hands-on with Canva while exploring how you can build your brand, define its personality and create a brand kit. We'll have times for questions uh, as part of tonight's session, and you can type those into the Q&A box on your Zoom screen. Our presenter this evening is Nick Belshaw. He is a design educator at Canva and has extensive experience hosting creative in-person and online design sessions. You may even recognize him from Canva's YouTube channel. Nick, thank you for joining us. Hi there, how are you? Um, all right, so I can take it from here, I think. Um, yes, take it me... away, thanks Nick. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, let me just share my screen so we're all on the same page. All right, hopefully that is all being shared now and you can see what's going on. Um, well, yeah, it's um, fantastic to be here. Thanks so much for, for joining us for tonight's workshop. Um, we're actually going to be going through a one of my favorite sessions. Um, I'm kind of going to be sneaking you through the back door of the branding world um, for a bit of a branding 101. So we're going to look at some really interesting stuff tonight. Um, but before we get into that, um, I just wanted to uh, get a few formalities out of the way. So um, if uh, any of you are interested to learn more or connect with our community on Facebook, um, I really encourage you to jump onto um, the Canva Design Circle. It's our uh, global community uh, where you can um, essentially connect with all of our users from all over the world. Um, it's a very active community. So if you're working on a business um, or you've got, um, you know, maybe you're just getting started with design and you really want some feedback or you wanna see what other people are making in Canva, um, it's an awesome place to start. Um, so that's the Canva design circle. Um, so um, just a little bit about me. So I'm Nick. Um, I've been at Canva for about two years now. Um, and I've been working there as a brand designer, but specifically on a platform called Design School. Uh, so Design School is our learning resource for um, all of our users, uh, all 45 million of them now coming every month to the platform. Um, it's a place for them to come and learn about different design specialties um, and also how to leverage Canva as a design tool. Um, so you can learn about um, you know, how to master social media. Um, we've recently launched a course on um, uh, being a Pinterest creator. Um, we've got lots of stuff on presentations and graphic design and branding. And so a lot of what you hear today, um, there's a lot of content on Design School um, for you guys to check out. Um, so that is a little about me. Now, what about you? I actually really would love to know a little bit about what you guys are, are working on, where you're dialing in from. Um, yeah, let's try and break the ice a little bit. So there's a chat in Zoom and I'd love for you to... Um, type in where you're dialing in from and, um, and whether you have a business that you're working on. And if you do, what's, uh, what's your business called? Cool. I can see Catherine uh, from Kellyville in the Hills. Awesome. Imagineering, a, a two, Imagineering two, a better world. Okay. Interesting. And we've got a, looks like a web designer or someone helping with web websites on here. Awesome. Okay. And looks like account keeping bass and bookkeeping business from Helen. Great. Well, I'm sure there's going to be tons of different businesses uh, from all of you um, across lots of different industries tonight. So um, a lot of the content I'm going to cover is quite broad and um, it's quite surprising that it actually relates to every kind of business. Um, we're going to look at um, a few things. Um, so for example, whoops, before we get to that, we're going to be looking at things like your purpose and values and um, how to formulate some kind of strategy around your, your business idea. Um, then we're going to look at a 
style guide and um, I guess the sorts of things that go into that. Um, so we're going to look at how to um, create some brand assets that um, uh, go into a style guide. So by the end of the session, you'll have some really tangible assets that you can use um, for your business and hopefully have a really good um, you know, understanding of how to take your business to the next step. So um, I just need to go back a couple of slides here. I've got a worksheet um, for you to work on. Um, if you'd like to follow along with some of the content we're going to go through tonight. Um, so if you type this into your browser, um, it should give you, uh, actually, I'm just going to put this in the chat. No, I'm not going to put it in the chat. I'll put it in the Q&A. Well, um, what this will give you is a, um, uh, it'll take you straight into Canva. Um, so into the editor and it'll bring up a, a kind of a special document that I've prepared for tonight. So it's a really kind of rudimentary uh, brand style guide. So it's really, really simple, um, you know, I guess a way of starting to structure some of these elements into um, a, a simple guide. Um, so um, give that a go. Um, cool. Yes. So as I said, once you type that link in, you should take you to this page here. If you don't have a Canva account yet, um, so uh, you'll, you'll need to create one. It's, it's completely free um, and that'll um, then get you into the Canva editor so you can see, um, see the workbook. All right, so um, let's get into it. So just a little about Canva. So we, really started out with this mission to empower the whole world to design. And what that really means for us is design for everyone. So we have this kind of, um, I guess, a very ambitious goal um, where we think that everyone is inherently creative, whether you're eight years old or 80 years old, we think you can jump onto Canva and, and design something beautiful. So um, we have this, this you know, really ambitious goal to try and empower the whole world um, with design tools and resources. Um, it's been about an eight year long journey so far. Um, our company is obviously global now. And um, as I said before, we've got about 45 million users that come to the platform every month. And um, yes, uh, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a, been a fantastic um, process and journey for us to um, obviously um, empower people and give them the resources they need in whatever industry or whatever, wherever they find themselves designing. Um, so, Today, we're going to be looking at, um, we're going to break down what a brand is. And um, I think um, this can be a little confusing. Um, you know, when you hear the word brand, a lot of people think of uh, things like a logo um, or maybe um, some kind of imagery or some sort of, you know, visual identity even is another synonym for brand. Um, but uh, we're going to find out today, it is actually a lot more than that as well. So, um, we've, we've got a, a few short videos as we go through the presentation um, from some people that we've worked with um, on uh, some of our branding content. Um, so we're going to hear from James Gilmore next about uh, branding. So let's jump in. I think, I think for, for me, me it is a connected, connected set of behaviors. behaviors. So, so it's, it's how, how I speak, it's how I communicate with others, others. It's, it's how I... I promote myself, it's how, how I react. react. When, when something, something goes wrong, what, what do, do I do to fix it? it? When you when have, have a problem, problem how, how am I there? there? Um, and in, in that, that sense, sense, you know, a brand, brand is a very human thing. thing. It's very amorphous. And more and more, more it needs to move into, into very different, different places, places of our life. life. So, so it, it might, might be how, how you talk to something, something like, like an Alexa, Alexa, or the, or the way the text, text is worded from your phone company, or an advocacy on the street. It's all of those things. Uh, was that a little bit echoey for everyone? I'm not sure if that was just me or um, that might have been a little bit of reverb or echo going on. Um, yes, there was echo. Okay, just give me one second. I'm just going to fix that because we have a few more little videos and things that it'll be important to uh, get that right. Just give me one second. Okay. So that was... Um, uh, apologies for that. Um, so that was James Gilmore. Um, he is a creative director at um, a agency here in Sydney called Design Studio. Um, but I think what he's really getting at here is that um, a brand is much more than just 
um, these, these sort of like touch points or, you know, like a logo. So obviously it includes things like, you know, maybe the tone of voice. So the way you speak to people, um, it might include a color palette and, um, you know, all of your visual assets like logos and graphic devices and typography and imagery and all that sort of stuff. But more than that, it's, it's a promise to your customers. So you can think of it, uh, I mean, it's really the associations and experiences that people have when they think of your brand. Um, and it's as simple as that. So um, people might associate a certain vibe or a certain communication style with you or your brand. And that's really what um, you know, branding is all about. Um, so today we're gonna be working on a very simple uh, brand uh, visual identity. So this is one that I put together earlier. So this is my imaginary um, music streaming brand, Soundscaper. And you can see here, we've got a logo, we've got a color palette, we've got some image uh, style, styling, and we've got some typography as well. So uh, we're gonna work through all of these um, throughout the session and hopefully um, you'll have um, some of these assets all put together by the end. So we need to start here with purpose. And this is something that might seem really obvious and quite often, um, you know, may, maybe a little um, ob obvious to, to, to talk about, but I think purpose is something that is overlooked quite often um, by a lot of businesses. Um, quite often by businesses that have been around for a while, they seem to forget what their purpose is and um, you can kind of get caught up in, in the day-to-day -day and um, it can sort of lead you off track if you lose sight of what this is. Um, just to kind of illustrate this a little bit more, we've got a really great video from someone called Simon Sinek. Some of you might've seen this before. Why, how, what? This little idea explains why some organizations and some leaders are able to inspire where others aren't. Let me define the terms really quickly. Every single person, every single organization on the planet knows what they do, 100%. Some know how they do it, whether you call it your differentiating value proposition or your proprietary process or your USP. But very, very few people or organizations know why they do what they do. And by why, I don't mean to make a profit. That's a result. It's always a result. By why, I mean what's your purpose? What's your cause? What's your belief? Why does your organization exist? Why do you get out of bed in the morning? And why should anyone care? Well, as a result, the way we think, the way we act, the way we communicate is from the outside in. It's obvious. We go from the clearest thing to the fuzziest thing. But the inspired leaders and the inspire or inspired organizations, regardless of their size, regardless of their industry, all think, act, and communicate from the inside out. Let me give you an example. I use Apple because they're easy to understand and everybody gets it. If Apple were like everyone else, a marketing message from them might sound like this. We make great computers. They're beautifully designed, simple to use, and user-friendly. Want to buy one? Meh. And that's how most of us communicate. That's how most marketing is done, that's how most sales is done, and that's how most of us communicate interpersonally. We say what we do, we say how we're different or how we're better, and we expect some sort of behavior, a purchase, a vote, something like that. Here's our new law firm. Uh, we have the best lawyers with the biggest clients. We have, you know, we always perform for our clients, do business with us. Here's our new car. It gets great gas mileage, it has, you know, leather seats. Buy our car. But it's uninspiring. Here's how Apple actually communicates. Everything we do, we believe in challenging the status quo. We believe in thinking differently. The way we challenge the status quo is by making our products beautifully designed, simple to use, and user-friendly. We just happen to make great computers. Want to buy one? Totally different, right? You're ready to buy a computer from me. All I did was reverse the order of the information. What it proves to us is that people don't buy what you do, people buy why you do it. People don't buy what you do, they buy why you do it. Great, yes. Um, some of you might have seen Simon before. He's a very charismatic speaker and that video is quite famous. Um, I think it really encapsulates, um, I guess, the essence of um, you know, defining your purpose and branding and the difference between you know, really successful companies and, and um, how they're able to do it. So um, I think just, you know, just to note here, um, this, high, this why, how, what uh, kind of 
uh, radius, circular radius forms almost like a, uh, a decision-making framework. Um, you know, I mentioned at the beginning that Canva exists because we want to empower the whole world to design. And if we're working on something that isn't driving that mission forward, then it makes it really easy for us to make a decision to cut it out and, and, um, and go back to the drawing board and, and find something that does help us move that mission forward. So um, I think the, uh, the purpose uh, or defining a purpose and getting it really, really clear um, is just so important um, for you know, staying focused as a company. Um, so yeah, just thought that video was really, really, um, really inspiring and really helpful. So just some other examples here, um, we've got Tesla. Um, so they really, uh, their mission, if you like, is to accelerate the world's transition to sustainable energy. Uh, Nike, they um, bring inspiration and innovation to every athlete in the world. And they believe that if you have a body, then you're an athlete. And of course, we exist to empower the world to design. Um, so these are examples of purposes. Um, sometimes they're called mission statements, um, but it's not a tagline. Um, we have uh, a tagline which is designed for everyone. Um, and that's what empower the world to design translates into. Um, but a tagline is slightly different to a mission statement um, or, a, or a purpose. The purpose is, is something that's more internal. So in your workbook, um, there's a, sp a spot there for you to write your purpose. Um, so some of you might already have um, your uh, purpose in your head or some idea of what it would sound like. Um, so this is a, a good chance for you to um, sharpen it up a little bit. So, um, you know, it can be a whole paragraph uh, and then you've got to try and figure out how to kind of edit it down to the essence of really why you exist. And um, it might, might seem a bit silly, but um, trust me, it, it really is helpful if you can get super clear on this, because as we saw, it, everything radiates out from, from this um, core seed, if you like. <clears throat> so um, I'm, I'm going to keep going through the workshop, but um, you've got a space there for you to write your purpose. And of course, uh, after the workshop, you can go back through and start to fill in some of the, um, um, the spaces that we've got in the, in the workbook. So the next ingredient that we need to look at is values. And values are, some, uh, I guess, an extension of your purpose. Um, they really are all about guiding your culture. So uh, that kind of tells people, this is how we do things around here. Um, so they are, are, I guess, more internal than external um, facing. So um, these are our values at Canva. So um, we have empower others, be a good human, make complex things simple, be a force for good, set crazy big goals and make them happen and pursue excellence. And so um, they really do help us all align with, um, you know, I guess the sorts of projects and things that we work on. Um, and they communicate to um, within, our, within our company and also to prospective, uh, prospective employees that might come to our company about what we, what we stand for. Um, so there's also a space in your workbook to write some values as well. So, um, you know, try and make sure that they're um, really specific. You know, most companies will kind of uh, build their entire organization around these values. Um, so yeah, I think we've got a space um, here just for three, but of course you can um, edit this whole page and create more values if you, if you need, um, but three should be plenty to kind of get you started. All right, so the another, another, I guess, ingredient or another way of thinking about um, your brand purpose is um, personality. So we, we know you can't please everyone and uh, you just end up really disappointing people if you try. Um, and that's just the case with, you know, interpersonally, that's the way humans behave. Um, and I think, um, you know, if you think about maybe your best friend or, you know, a close friend of yours and, you know, what are they like? Are they, um, are they serious and practical or are they kind of a bit more cheeky and funny um, and charismatic? Um, I think brands are, are very similar to people. So they, you know, you don't really have friends who occupy who are, who are all things to everybody. You know, they always occupy some sort of um, spectrum of, of um, human emotion and behavior. Um, so I think it's really important to figure out where your brand sits um, in this kind of, uh, I guess, spectrum of, of emotion and behavior. So we've got a few tools to help with this. Um, but yeah, before we get into that, um, uh, this is another way of, I guess, breaking it down. So um, you can think of your personality in sort of two ways. So um, the, the central part is the brand core. So 
this is the unchanging part. This is the purpose which we've gone through, what you believe in, what your you know your values are, um, and this this aspect um, is permanent. It doesn't change. Um, you know, this is the, the the core of your of your essence of who you are. Uh, and then we have the brand identity, and a brand identity is really all about how you express yourself. And you see brands do this all the time. They um, you know they update. As trends change, you know they move with the speed of culture. So when new new things are happening, they're not afraid to embrace um, the you know current kind of trend of the day. Um, so this is all about how you interact with people and um, how you speak and how you dress. So this can obviously change. Um, so those are kind of the two elements of of a brand, um, uh, yeah, of, of a brand strategy. So um, there's a couple of tools here that are going to help with figuring out. Um, your positioning with this personality piece. Um, this is just a really simple exercise. Um, again, this is certainly not a comprehensive list of um, human emotions. Um, it's just a few, but uh, it might help you start to identify what your your tone is as as your brand person. So you know how you might start to talk to your consumers um, or uh, yeah to to your audience. So um, there is a spot over here in the workbook um, where you can just kind of move these dots around um, to kind of figure out um, yeah, where you sit on that spectrum. Obviously not knowing about all of your businesses, it's a little hard for me to jump in with an example here, um, but I've got another great um, resource that might help. Um, so this one's called the Brand Archetypes. And um, some of you might have seen these before. Um, these were actually developed over decades of research by Carl Jung, uh, and they were eventually adopted by the advertising industry. And um, these kind of 12 archetypes, um, again, they are not completely exhaustive or comprehensive. Um, a lot of brands sometimes occupy multiple archetypes, but this is a really good place to start um, thinking about your brand personality. So the idea is that you start in the middle here with almost like a, um, a core um, personality trait, um, and then you work, you move your way out. So um, you know maybe uh, one of our, um, our personality traits is to provide structure, um, and then perhaps we're an innovative company, so you know creator is a good fit for for Canva. Um, so you can check out this link here. It's um, iconfox.com.au slash brand dash archetypes. Um, and you can read a little bit more about all of these, uh, but these are also in the workbook as well. Um, so just to give you a little bit of an example here. So uh, yes, Canva is definitely a creator and uh, we sit alongside companies like Lego, Adobe and Apple. And it's all about um, seeing potential everywhere and uncovering originality with a liberated imagination. Sounds very uh, eloquent when you put it that way. Um, so some other examples here, um, we've got Nike. They're a really good fit for the um, hero archetype. Um, and of course, Patagonia, um, very good fit for the explorer. Um, they're all about exploring the unknown and the edges of the world. Um, uh, I love their brand. They've got a very strong brand personality and um, an archetype. Okay, so um, we'll keep going along into the style guide next. So um, this is really the, um, the tangible part of your brand. And um, this is um, really codifies and encapsulates all of the visual assets or visual expression of your brand. So um, it can include things like a logo, a color palette, typography, image choice. Um, it can even include uh, things like graphic devices, which might be, you know, a small uh, visual asset that you use in conjunction with your logo. Um, you know, it could be things like um, the way you, co um, you you compose elements on a page. So, you know, things like how much clear space do you leave around your logo? Um, you know, minimum sizing of things. There's, there's all sorts of rules. I mean, it, it can go really deep here. And um, the bigger you, you grow, some companies tend to... Um, I guess, throw a lot of money um, at things like, you know, brand Bibles, which is essentially a really large version of a um, style guide um, and kind of manage um, down to the, every single pixel, you know, what their brand and how, how it's represented 
um, in marketing and online and, and elsewhere. So um, I don't think we're going to go that uh, in depth today. Um, we're just going to try and pull together just some really simple assets like what you see here. Um, but it's certainly helpful to have something like this, even if it's just one page that you can give to your web designer when you start building a new website for your business. Um, you know, here's my logo, here's the colors I use, here's some, here's some photography, and these are the fonts I want you to use. That's already going to give the designer a really good idea of how to make sure that um, everything they create um, you know, represents your, your brand. Uh, so just a, a little shameless plug here for Canva. Uh, we have a, um, a really great feature built in to Canva Pro. It's called Brand Kit. So um, this is really like your style guide built into um, you know, a digital version. So it's a place for you to add your logos. Um, so maybe you've got a primary and a secondary logo. You can set up color palettes. Maybe you have a color palette just for one campaign. You can set that up there. Um, it's really flexible and easy to keep all of your stuff in one place. And then you can apply it to your designs really quickly. Just with one click, you can apply all of those assets um, to a template or to, to a design really quickly. Um, so that's really, really cool. Um, Brand Kit is just in Canva on the homepage. You'll see it in the left there. Okay, so uh, let's keep going because I'm conscious of time and we've got a fair bit to get through. Um, so we're going to have a look at naming now. And maybe um, this might seem like um, not necessarily a useful thing to look at. Um, probably a lot of you already have a name for your business or you have some idea of what you're going to call um, your company. But there's certainly some advice I think I can give you that might help a little bit here. So um, there's really a few boxes you're trying to tick. So um, the first three, um, making, uh, choosing a memorable name, something that's purposeful and something that's appropriate. Most of us know that already. That's pretty self-explanatory. Um, but you'll be surprised at how many people forget to check availability. Um, and what that means is you need to check for things like, uh, obviously, is the name being used by somebody else? So um, you, know, you can look on. Uh, ASIC, you know, Australia's um, business registry to, to have a look at um, any kind of trademark um, or copyright um, of, of name, name use there. Um, and also it means checking for things like domain names uh, for a website, uh, social media handles, um, anything where you might uh, want to move into in the future. Um, so yeah, very important to check that one. Uh, so generally speaking, when you're trying to brainstorm for new names, um, a lot of people just trust their gut, um, and which is fine. And some of the most innovative and iconic names happen that way. Um, but here's a little bit of a uh, naming framework that might help. Um, you can think about names in really three different buckets. So you have descriptive names. Um, so they're just literally describing exactly what you do. So Whole Foods is a good example. Um, Amazon is a good example of an emotive name. Um, so it's kind of like a feeling or an emotion behind your name. Um, that you want your customer or your audience to ex experience or feel. And then, of course, you have invented names. Um, so Google obviously didn't exist um, until, uh, I guess, uh, the two founders uh, came up with that, that word, and now it's probably one of the most used words in the world. Um, but that's obviously where you're going to have a lot, a lot less issues with availability if you're coming up with an invented name. Um, it gets a little bit more uh, involved from here. Um, obviously, you can take hybrid names, so where you might take part of one word and merge it with another word. Um, you can get really creative that way and, and come up with something um, very innovative and new. Um, and yeah, I guess there's lots of different ways you can, you can approach it. Um, but yeah, nothing better than getting a blank sheet of paper and just start scrolling some names down. And, and obviously, um, try and get some outside counsel when you're naming your business. You know, try and tell as many people as you can and ask them um, what comes to mind when you tell them that name, what kind of feeling do they get from that name? Okay, um, so we're gonna jump into color now. Um, this is one of my favorite topics and um, certainly another quite a deep uh, topic. Um, color is pretty iconic in, in branding and there are certainly some rules and uh, I guess, background that we need to look at um, in terms of choosing maybe a primary color and um, some secondary uh, and tertiary colors for maybe a color palette. Um, so this is what we're going to create. Um, we've got a space in our workbook for, um, for four colors here. So um, I'm going to show you in a moment how you can um, apply some colors to these gray squares. Um, 
But before we do that, we're going to have a quick look at the color wheel. So um, hopefully most of you have seen this before, probably in about grade three or four. Um, but what you have here is primary colors, which mix into secondary colors, which mix into tertiary colors, which make up the 12 colors of the color wheel. And it gets a little bit um, more complex from here. So um, we start to look at combining color together and um, it can be a little bit difficult to know what's gonna work. So we have color harmonies, uh, which are really based in scientific research to help um, combine colors together. So they have some pretty funky names like analogous, triadic, uh, monochromatic. And um, these just really describe um, how you take different points on the color wheel and combine them together to create a, a palette. Um, and there's, a, there's actually a few more here, um, which we'll have a look in a moment um, in a little demonstration. But you can see here, uh, monochromatic, it's actually one of my favorite palettes because it's actually just one hue, one color, but you're adding different degrees of tint or shade to create um, contrast. So you're getting uh, you know, quite a varied palette um, that works, but it's also very uh, recognizable. So you know, if you're using that as a brand, um, that one palette, that one color becomes instantly recognizable. So I've got a little bit of a brand game for you guys. Um, love someone to answer me. Uh, what is the, what brand is this? You can pop it in the Q and A if you like. No takers? I know you all know the answer. Well, I'm not seeing any uh, any answers here, but it's Google in case you're wondering. Um, they're iconic for four colors. Um, everything they do is colored in these, draped in these four colors, sometimes a little bit excessively, but that is Google. What about this one? Well, I can't see any answers coming through, but this one is Coca-Cola. Um, I've had some people tell me that they thought it was Nike. Um, I mean, there's probably a lot of companies that use colors that are very close to this, um, but obviously Coca-Cola are pretty iconic with their red, black, and white um, branding and packaging. And I've got one more for you here. Hopefully that one's really easy. This one, of course, is Instagram. And what I love about this one is that it's actually not even really a color palette. It's, um, it's a gradient. So, um, you know, you, you're not even really, uh, I don't think Instagram ever really use these colors individually. Um, they're, they're always using them across this kind of um, gradient, which becomes super recognizable again for, for them and their brand. So a little bit more on, um, I guess, the subtext of color. So there is a lot of, I guess, inherent meaning behind uh, color choices. And this has a lot to do with culture. And of course it changes uh, depending where in the world you are. Um, you know, in Western cultures, a lot of these associations um, are definitely ring true. But, um, you know, if you go to Russia or somewhere else, um, maybe some of, uh, some of these associations won't make sense. So it's always really important to obviously figure out where your audience is because sometimes this association won't always be the same, but, what I love about this is that um, you can group a lot of brands um, based on their color choice. So for example, you see a lot of um, pharmaceutical and cosmetic brands using white. Um, and that's because it's really, um, it's clean and sterile, um, right? And, and that's, that's obviously an, um, a trait they wanna communicate. Um, you see a lot of insurance companies and um, I guess banks and, and professional services using blue because um, it's super dependable and, and secure. Uh, and then I guess, you know, getting over to the red and yellow, we, we obviously see a lot of uh, the McDonald's's and other fast food restaurants and food brands using red and yellow because it's kind of hunger and passion and happiness. Um, so there's, there's definitely a lot um, going on behind your color choice. Um, I think it's really important to stop and reflect about what your color choice is saying about you and how can you use color to underscore the meaning of your brand or your, your message. Um, but it's not all about um, just choosing uh, a color that um, underscores the meaning. Um, you could also look at your brand competitors and what colors they're using. 
Um, so in the example of my Soundscaper streaming, uh, music streaming brand, um, there's actually quite a few music streaming services out there, as you probably know. So in my case, I probably want to avoid green because Spotify is green. And I also probably want to avoid orange because uh, SoundCloud is orange. So um, blue seems like a pretty safe choice. Um, you know, I'm occupying a part of that color wheel that no other brand or similar company is using. Um, so you don't have to go quite as berserk as this diagram here, but um, you can see plotting your competitors on this color wheel can be a really helpful way of identifying a gap within, um, I guess, the, the market you're trying to compete in. Um, just a little bit more on color accessibility here. Um, so what a lot of brands end up doing is choosing a color palette like this one here, you know, this uh, kind of a really bright red and then um, a not so different orange color. And it might look really cool on the page. And when you select it, you're thinking, yeah, this is like, it's a really warm palette. It, it really kind of speaks to the passion and, and, and hunger that you want for your brand or whatever it might be. But um, you really need to consider um, uh, the accessibility of your color. So we're talking about um, people who have vision impairments um, and obviously not being able to um, read or interpret um, you know, the, the piece of communication that you're creating. So you can see here the top um, example has a much more effective or high contrast um, color palette. Um, so there are a whole bunch of tools out there to help you uh, figure out whether your color choices are compliant with, um, there's a lot of, I guess, compliance with accessibility for, um, for readability online and legibility. Um, one of them is, uh, I think it's called TopTel. Let me see if I can find it very quickly for you because it is very interesting. Um, I might have to come back to this. I've forgotten the name of it. It escapes me at the moment, but there's a really good website where you can type in the URL to your website and it will scan uh, the website and actually display it in a specific way that a person with color blindness would see um, your website. So you can straight away see uh, whether there are any kind of um, readability issues uh, with your colors and things like that. Um, so I'm gonna, whoops, go back here. Uh, I'm gonna show you a really great resource we have, um, which is our colors page. Um, so let's go into canva.com slash colors. It's spelt the American way, unfortunately, uh, as we have uh, quite a lot of users over there. Um, so this is uh, a really great resource where you can find, um, uh, first of all, the color wheel. Um, so we talked a little bit about these color harmonies before. So, um, you know, an example here, if I choose a triadic color palette <clears throat> to get three colors that are sort of equal points on the color wheel. So you can see my primary point here, if I move that around, it's choosing my other two colors, which is pretty cool. Um, so let me choose that blue color that I had before, somewhere around there. And I can also add some tint in there, make it a bit darker. Uh, and there we go, I've got my three colors here. So it uh, makes it really easy to um, copy this uh, little code down here. This is called a hex code. Um, so there's these six numbers um, or letters. And if you click on that, it'll copy. And let's go back over to the brand book here. And I'm going to make this gray square um, that primary color. So I'll click on the gray square, come over to the little color tile in the toolbar um, on the top left here. And then you can see here, I've got a whole bunch of different colors I can choose. I'm just going to paste that hex code straight into the search bar at the top of the color panel. So paste that in and there it is It's from, from my search. And there we go, I've got my color in. So let me see if I can do the other two. I'll copy that one. Um, we'll paste that one in. Great, and we'll do the last one. Oh, I've got Zoom stuff out of the way. Cool, there we go. So I've got some colors based on the triadic uh, color harmony, which is really cool. Hopefully that's really useful. Um, I'm hoping you're all nodding along and finding that quite helpful.
Um, so if you want to learn a little bit more about some of these color harmonies, if you're interested, um, you know, like I am, I'm a, a bit of a um, design color nerd. Um, I love uh, learning more about how these palettes work. So you can see here, there's a little bit of an explanation for how they all come together. Uh, and beyond that, we have um, this one here, color meanings, which is uh, a really cool space to learn a little bit more about the symbolism and meaning behind um, certain colors. Um, so for example, if we take, uh, we've been looking at a lot of red, so let's have a look. Scarlet. So you can see here, um, this will give you a lot more information about how to convert from um, different color gamuts. So you might've heard of things like RGB and CMYK, two different color spaces used for different things. Um, there's sort of tips here for converting those. There's a lot more about how to use these orange, uh, this, this color with other colors. Um, yeah, it's really, really cool stuff. So please check out that, um, that page, really, really helpful. Lots of really cool stuff on um, the colors page. All right, so uh, we're gonna jump into some typography next. Um, this is another really big uh, topic and we'll try and break it down into some easy to understand um, categories for fonts. So what we're talking about here is, uh, I think there's a few synonyms. Uh, sometimes you hear people talk about fonts. Uh, sometimes you hear people talk about typefaces, uh, font families. Um, they're essentially all the same thing. Um, they have slightly different classifications, but for the purpose of, of um, this talk, um, we'll just go with fonts. So the first question I have for you guys, does anyone know the difference between serif and sans? Kate says, yes. Catherine says, no, that's, that's okay. Uh, we're gonna learn. <laughs> so serifs have little feet on the edges of the letters. Um, they're called serifs and they're designed to help guide your eye across the page. They actually come from the days of, I guess the Gutenberg press um, or, you know, super old um, uh, uh, typesetting where um, the idea was that when you are reading a line of text, these little serifs or little decorative kind of um, flourish, flourishes help um, align your eye with the next letter. And it just makes it a little bit easier for legibility. Um, so super common in classic traditional kind of print. Um, and they have a very like old school um, classic look to them or vibe about them. Um, whereas sans serif or sans, uh, it's just simply French for without, um, hence the little beret. Um, but these really uh, arose out of the need for an alternative to serifs because um, you know digital screens, uh, when they first came about, they were super low resolution and the little serifs wouldn't render properly on the screen. So they needed a new classification. So they came up with sans and they have this very kind of clean and modern uh, feel to them, um, which is really cool. Um, and we're gonna talk about a third category here, which um, is a little bit broader, um, which is called display. So display are uh, essentially um, fonts that have a lot of personality. So you wanna use them in small doses. Um, they're perfect for things like logos, um, maybe you know headlines, um, just small bits of text. But if you try to write a whole paragraph of text using a display font, um, you're gonna find your reader is really gonna struggle to um, you know, struggle with legibility and struggle to actually interpret what's being said. So you wanna use something a little bit more practical. Um, and sort of pragmatic, like a serif or sans serif for your long bits of text. So um, those are the kind of three broad categories. Um, obviously within display, uh, you have lots of subcategories like script and black letter and decorative and all sorts of different stuff. Um, but just broadly speaking, they're all fit into this super category called display. Uh, so I've got another little game for you guys. Uh, can anyone tell me what brands we've got on the screen here? Now, just to help clarify what you're looking at here, you're seeing the brand name has been replaced by the font choice or the name of the font choice that they've used. Um, so Futura here is um, the name of a, of a font um, used by a very famous brand. B got Instagram. Yes, hopefully we've all got that one. 
Yes, Nike is the, the next one. So there's a whole bunch here. Maybe it'll help if I go to the next slide. How about now? Well, hopefully you're all now getting it. So we've got Airbnb over here, Adobe, Twitter, and then Spotify. And these are the respective fonts that they've used. And they're all quite, um, I guess, famous or publicly available fonts. Um, you know, nothing too uh, custom that they've, they've gone with. Um, just very simple um, using the, uh, you know, whatever the type designer has created, they've just used it as is. Uh, another short video here from uh, James, I believe. Let's have a listen. Finding the right typeface comes back to understanding what you want to communicate, who you are and why you're communicating in this way. You can be big and loud and proud and brash, but if you are a minimal mid-century furniture company, that probably won't feel right for you. Um, typography is the opportunity to connect the dots between who you are and how you articulate that out into the world. So I think, think of it as another opportunity, like the logo and the identity and the color system to express a little bit of your personality, which will come to life through the language, but also through the typeface choice you make. Yeah, so I think uh, what James is getting at there is, um, you know, just, just like the color choice that you make, there is always going to be some subtext behind your typography choice. Um, one of my favorite little bits of trivia or a bit of a little funny fact is that um, the human brain interprets images something like 40,000 times faster than words. So before your brain has even read the word that's on the page, um, it's already making judgments about the message um, based on the type choice that the designer has made. Um, so for example, here you've got one, uh, a font pairing called Cocktail Hour, which is written in this lovely kind of script typeface. So straight away, I'm thinking this is, you know, kind of maybe a bit creative, organic. There's something going on there. It feels sort of artisan maybe. Um, you're already making some kind of judgment about what this brand is all about. So um, I guess, um, when you're pairing, uh, choosing fonts and trying to pair them together, um, it's really important to think about what that subtext is behind um, the font because it can really help. Um, you know, it's another opportunity to communicate really quickly um, what you stand for and all of the previous stuff that we've worked on with your brand strategy. Uh, I love this. Um, I certainly would love to receive the note on the left rather than the one on the right. Um, as you can see, the font choice really does change the entire meaning of the message sometimes. So um, I'm gonna show you now how to find fonts within Canva and how to um, potentially pair some together as well. Um, we'll look at some pre-made pairs first and then um, I'll show you how to, uh, some rules for picking uh, complementary or secondary fonts to go with your primary choice. So uh, let's come over to uh, the workbook here. And we have a page, about page 11 here for your typography. Um, so the first thing I wanna show you, if you go over to the left in the object panel, um, there is a text area. And this is where you can see um, our kind of like um, text templates. Um, they're almost like little pre-made um, font pairs that our designers have put together. Some of them have um, pretty funky looking text effects on them, like colors and different um, interesting effects. Um, if you keep scrolling down here, there's a whole bunch um, for all sorts of different things. So um, if we take perhaps uh, this marketing proposal one here, we'll add that in. It doesn't want to go. Oh, there we go. Get rid of that one. So you can see here, this one, I've got two typefaces. I'm just gonna make it a little bit smaller so we can see a little bit easier. Um, so I've got this headline, which is League Spartan. And then I've got this sub headline here, which is Sanchez. Um, and these are grouped together, um, obviously as a text block. Um, if I wanna ungroup these so I can uh, define my primary and secondary, I can just hit ungroup at the top here. And now I'll be able to move these sort of independently from each other. 
So let's maybe make that a little bigger. Uh, maybe we can bring that out like this. Cool, so now I've got um, a primary and a secondary font. And you can see here, my primary font is a sans serif and my secondary is a serif. Um, you can see the little um, decorative feet on the, on the letters. Uh, so that's a really easy way to get started. There's tons and tons of different um, font pairs in the text library there. Um, kind of a foolproof way. We take all the guesswork out of pairing fonts for you um, in that little, uh, little feature. So um, some other tips here, if you want to start combining your own fonts together, um, I think it's uh, really helpful if you try to stick with one family, you can actually create really good font pairs by just grabbing one font. So you can see here, um, in our, excuse me, in our font library, we have, um, for example, Poppins, um, which is in a bold, a medium and a light version. So you could use the bold uh, version for your headlines and then medium for uh, maybe your body or your subheadline, and then light for something like a, a block quote or something else. Um, so you can start to assign roles to your fonts just by using one, one typeface. Um, it's a really simple way to go. Uh, another good tip is to use something called a super family. Um, so this is, uh, well, it's not just Superman with his no feet, which I love, but it's when you take two uh, fonts, uh, sorry, it's when, the, it's when a font designer will create multiple fonts uh, within the same family that cross multiple classifications. So you can see here with Noto Sans, uh, it also comes in a serif, You've got Noto Serif here. So um, these are designed to work really well together. Um, they complement, they kind of uh, fit in the same family uh, and they're made by one type designer, um, but they're obviously different classifications. Um, so they work really harmoniously. Um, there's lots of uh, super families within Canva as well. Um, and by the way, if you want to find some of these, um, when you're in the Canva editor here and you want to choose a new font um, up here where we've got uh, in the toolbar, we've got League Spartan. Uh, if we click on that, it'll, it'll bring up the font uh, switcher uh, and you can search for fonts based on a um, keyword. Um, so you can see here, there's some predefined keywords here, um, but we could just type in something like, um, Let's see if fun works. Yes, okay, cool. It's giving me a whole bunch of fun looking fonts. Well, that's very unreadable. Um, but yeah, a really easy way to find fonts based on um, just by searching for a type of word or, or a feeling. Um, another really important rule here is to remember that um, opposites attract when it comes to fonts. So, um, you should never try and take two fonts that are uh, very similar to each other because um, you put them on the page and they'll end up kind of um, like fighting with each other or competing for your attention and they just don't work. Um, you're much better off trying to find fonts that um, are completely opposite in some way. So whether that's taking, you know, maybe a tall font with a short one, um, you know, an extroverted with an introverted or a neutral font with something that has a lot of expression um, or personality, um, or, or of course, sans with a serif is a classic pairing, really easy. You can almost never go wrong with that pairing. Um, also, what you want to do here is um, maybe don't choose more than two fonts. Um, two is probably the maximum you want to go. If you start going for three or four different fonts and you've got it in one piece of communication, um, it just starts to look really messy. And there's no consistency across your communication. And Obviously, when it comes to branding, it's all about consistency. You want your audience to understand how one piece of communication is linked to another piece. So um, making sure you, you know, working with less fonts is always a better choice because there's a better chance that people are going to be able to associate it with your brand. Um, and also you want to assign some font roles here. So you can see um, with these two um, font choices, uh, we have for the headlines, Beavis New, and body, we have Roboto. So um, it basically, um, as long as you're using um, these fonts in their specific roles, um, it makes it really easy for you to know when to apply it in, in a given situation. Uh, and the same goes for size as well. And you can see here, a lot of the time, your headlines, you want them to be much bigger than the rest of your, your copy. And if you assign some kind of rules, again, this could go into your style guide. Um, you know, we always use uh, 160 point type for our um, headlines and all of our body is always 32 
or below. Um, you know, that could be the rule that you, you set. Um, again, starts to create consistency rules and helps guide um, your design decisions later on. So just to, to finish out here, I think um, this is a nice little quote. So um, the best font choices are the ones where the reader does not notice the font, but the message. Um, and that's really what it's all about. Um, you're just trying to underscore that message with something that matches perfectly, um, you know, and, and helps you communicate um, the message behind your, your marketing communication. Okay, so we're gonna jump into the final section here, which is imagery and um, have a look at, um, I guess, some of the ways we can combine imagery with branding. Um, of course, what we're talking about here, well, actually, I think we have a video next. Let's just see um, on the next slide. So uh, we have uh, really two things when we're talking about imagery, which is illustration and photography. Um, and I think there's a very good rationale for using one over the other. Um, so we're about to hear from Jason Little now. He's a um, creative director from an agency here in Sydney called For The People. Um, and he kind of goes into a little bit of the reason why you might use um, illustration over um, photography. The way I guess, I guess the most, most interesting, interesting thing about, about illustration, illustration is it doesn't, doesn't need to be based in reality. reality. So, so you can, you can uh, I don't know why that's echoing again. It was working perfectly before. Apologies, we'll just have to go with it. The way I guess the most interesting thing about illustration is it doesn't need to be based on reality. So you can have you can have this weird idea that you would never be able to do in photography because it would involve flying to the moon and you know having a having a set up there, or you can illustrate that, and that means um, for pro for tech products new products, startups, a lot of the time they're going, what what do I need in my imagery? I need to communicate an idea, but yet, you know, the product isn't finished yet, or we don't have an audience participating with it yet. Or So you can use illustration as, as a, a really good foundation to communicate the ideas behind your product or service. Yeah, so um, I think uh, sometimes a lot of brands will use a combination of photography and um, illustration. Um, of course, a lot of startups don't really have the budget to go out and hire a professional photographer to come and shoot everything for them, or uh, for that matter, an illustrator to come in and, and do some really beautiful bespoke illustration for your brand. Um, so that's obviously where Canva can certainly come to the rescue. Um, so we have a pretty extensive library of imagery um, of stock photography. So um, there's a huge library of free images, um, which is about everything you can think of. And then, of course, um, with our pro product, um, we you have access to even more. It's literally millions and millions of photos. Um, and just to give you, you know, an idea of how this might work here uh, for my music brand, let's see if we can search for uh, we want music plus live. And okay, so we've got a whole bunch of uh, photos in here, and I'm trying to establish uh, some kind of style. Let's go for this one, maybe this one. Okay, cool. So they're uh, all got a similar kind of energy to them. Uh, maybe this is starting to establish the way I want to approach my photography. Um, but there are other ways you can start to establish an image style um, and that you can do it here in Canva quite easily. So um, in this instance, maybe we want to um, always use some kind of filter um, to give the images a distinctive look that only your brand does. So um, let's give it a go. Let's try editing the images here. We'll use a filter. Um, we'll go for the street filter. Okay, so now I've got this kind of black and white um, aesthetic to my photography, um, which again, just is just another way to differentiate the style of photography that I'm using. Um, and also a very cheap and easy way to do it because you're just taking existing imageries, apply some kind of treatment, and there you go. That it sort of becomes um, synonymous with what you want, you, you want your brand to look like. Um, just a couple of the tips here. If you're looking for more imagery and you're having a bit of trouble finding uh, what you want within the photos um, tab here, um, if you come down to the more tab uh, over on the left 
um, there is a separate um, integration for Pexels and Pixabay. These are our two stock photography websites. And these stock photography libraries are a little bit better curated. Um, there's, they're all, um, the contributors are all professional photographers. So sometimes you can find better quality images if you search within one library um, on its own. Um, just a little design tip for you there. Um, so the next thing we wanna look at is illustration or graphic devices. So what we're really talking about here is um, other elements uh, beyond the logo and the typography that you might use in conjunction with you know, your, uh, your marketing messaging um, to help with that brand recognition. So you can easily imagine um, some of these little funky illustrated elements could go, uh, could be overlaid onto say like a social media post that I make for my music brand. And uh, if I start to use that consistently, that again becomes really recognizable. Um, so I'll just show you how to find some of these in, in Canva. Um, so I've got a page here to put in some illustrations. Um, so if you come over to the elements tab here, um, you can search uh, for uh, icons or you know, illustration types really easily. Um, some of my favorite uh, are actually animated um, stickers. Um, so these are obviously really popular now. If you're doing anything on social media, which you should be, um, and you want to make things a little bit more um, visual, um, you want to make things um, move, then um, this is the best way to do it. You, know, you can grab these really um, awesome elements. Um, let's grab this guy here. Um, there's some really beautiful stuff that's made by um, a lot of contributors, um, literally millions of different um, elements that you can, you can play around with. Um, so yeah. Uh, maybe I'll just come back here and go back to our, just scroll down a little bit here. We have um, these pre-made kind of illustration packs as well that can be really helpful if you're uh, struggling to find elements uh, that match or that work well together because you know maybe um, they're made by different designers. Um, this is a really good place to start. So you can see here, uh, bold foliage. We have a lot of illustrations that are designed to work really well together. And you can see here if um, I was gonna use this as part of my, I don't know, maybe my landscaping business, um, I could get a whole collection of beautiful illustrated plants and start to formulate some kind of, um, you know, it becomes a brand asset that I might wanna use. All right. So um, now we've gone through most of the brand style guide. We've looked at typography, we've looked, we've looked at colors, We've looked at illustration and graphic devices. What's left? Uh, well, the one thing we haven't looked at is a logo and arguably the most important part, right? So uh, let's take a quick look at this now. The logo will always be one of the most important parts of your brand. It clarifies and codifies everything you stand for, everything you want to be, and everything you want to communicate. It's about connecting with your audience immediately, clearly, and confidently. And I think the danger in creating an identity which is over complex is that you can alienate a lot of people. So my advice would always be to err on the side of clarity and simplicity. Um, and you can use other parts of your brand and experience to communicate other facets of who you are and what you want to say. Okay, so um, I think one of the key takeaways from James is that um, erring on the side of clarity and simplicity, I think that's really important. And um, it gets lost a lot of the time, um, especially when people are starting out with a new, uh, a new brand and they want to create a logo that encapsulates absolutely everything, um, you know, represents absolutely everything about their brand. Uh, but of course, you've got all these other touch points and other assets that you can use to really flesh out um, your brand. So try to um, err on the side of simplicity, I think is, is really important. Um, so here we have three kind of broad categories of logo. Well, actually it's, it's two, um, and the third is combining them both together. Um, so a symbol, a word mark, and both. And in case you're wondering what the both part is here. Um, FedEx quite famously have this arrow within the, the clear space between the E and the X. It's a little arrow pointing to the right. Hopefully you can all see that. Uh, and that's, that's actually something they use in their branding a lot. Um, obviously it represents moving forward. 
um, and delivery, I suppose. Um, so, you know, very clever, little simple, easy way of, um, I guess, adding some kind of visual gimmick to your logo. Um, so Nike is another good example, um, super famous, but um, obviously it meant nothing to everyone until uh, Nike invested billions of dollars to put meaning into this, um, this little swoosh. Um, in case you're wondering where it came from, it's actually based on, uh, well, Nike is the, uh, I believe it's the Greek, goddess, go, Greek goddess of victory. So it's a kind of abstracted wing. Um, but of course, um, it's taken on a whole new meaning now. Um, but I think the, the important thing to remember is um, logos aren't instantly iconic. Um, it happens over time. It happens over billions of impressions um, and obviously lots of money and marketing uh, power and, and um, you know, I guess, effort that's gone into um, putting that logo out into the world and, and uh, making sure people associate it with your, with your brand. So um, whoop, we'll come back. Uh, so with my logo here, I'm going to show you how I put this together really quickly. And um, hopefully you'll find uh, the logo tools within Canva really helpful for your own business. So um, to do this, I need to go back to the home screen and I'm going to find um, a logo template. So you can just come up to the search bar and, and do logo. It's probably the easiest way to do it. And um, it'll bring up all of our different logo templates. Um, so again, there's thousands of these um, that you can grab. Um, and all of these are um, royalty free. So um, I often get a question about copyright and whether there are any issues with copyright. Um, as long as you're not using any sort of like imagery, um, if, if they're from one of these templates, um, they're absolutely royalty free uh, for you to use. Um, of, all, of course, though, um, you won't be able to copyright some certain um, parts of the logo because these templates are available for anyone to use. So someone could certainly take the same template and use it as well. Um, so I think it's a great place to start using a template, but um, you certainly want to apply your own um, style to it. Um, so let's grab... I don't know where my cool logo is, but... Might take a different one today. Yeah, let's take this one. Okay, so um, this template here is fully editable. So I can come in here and update this with my brand name. Um, I need to make this a little bit wider. And I might just move all of these up a little bit. In fact, I don't even need that last line. There we go, cool. So maybe that's my logo, um, whoops. Uh, maybe what I also need here is uh, another version of my logo uh, that might work on uh, a different colored background. Oops, Let me just fix that up. So I'm gonna create a, another copy and I'll get rid of the background and then just make this straight black. Let's make all of these elements black. There we go. So uh, now I have a color version and a black and white version. Um, or you can even do it reverse. So you've got a black background with a white logo. So I've got a few different options. Um, so maybe that's my logo. Um, I can then copy that and bring that over to my style guide. Let's come back over to the last page here. So I can just get rid of this here. I'm just gonna paste it straight in. All right, really simple. Um, there's a lot of really cool new features actually within Canva for things like curved text. Um, so you can see here, um, this little, bit of text at the bottom has a little uh, curve within it. Um, so you can play with that and, and create um, these really interesting um, effects um, to your text. Um, but yeah, that's uh, that's a kind of a, a really simple way to kind of get a, a logo together and um, apply it to your, your style guide. Uh, there's also a page in here if you want to uh, try mocking up your logo onto a t-shirt. Um, it's always a bit of fun. And of course you can try doing this with all sorts of different um, uh, we have lots of mock-up uh, mock imagery within uh, Canva. 
um, to help you um, apply your your brand to different situations to kind of get an idea of how it might might appear on um, different brand collateral. Okay, so um, we're almost done here. I'm just going to uh, give you a quick note on templates uh, and just give you some resources um, before we open up to Q and A. Um, so first of all, when you're working with templates within Canva, um, quite quite often you'll notice um, the actual placeholder text on the page has um, it, it's it's kind of instructive. So it'll tell you what you're supposed to be writing in every single place. And this is really good for things like business plans. Um, we get a lot of students who find these templates super useful to help with, um, you know, for example, here, a, pro a problem statement structure. Uh, how do I outline a problem for my business that I'm trying to solve? So um, look out for those if you're writing, um, uh, you know, I guess business documents um, and you need a little bit of guidance. The, the templates themselves have some really great instructive text within them. Um, so uh, we, I know we've looked at how to create all of our brand assets from scratch, um, but I'm sure some of you will be loving to hear that we actually have these really beautiful marketing toolkits, uh, which are essentially, um, I guess, a template suite. Um, so you've got templates for you. So you, uh, actually, I'll, I'll jump over and show it to you. So it's canva.com slash uh, business resources business dash resources. Um, so on this page here, uh, you've got tons of toolkits um, that you can jump into and start branding. So um, you can see, for example, if I grab this consultant toolkit, um, I've got a Instagram uh, post, um, I've got uh, you know Facebook uh, posts, I've got a flyer, a brochure, um, you've got all sorts of different stuff to kind of help you get started with a whole um, I guess, suite of marketing collateral. Um, so really, really cool. There's heaps of um, interesting stuff here. Anyway, I'll let you explore all of that one. And um, for, all of the, <clears throat> for all of you that have a small business and you're looking for more resources, um, down here we have um, some more tutorials and different um, links to articles and things to help you, um, you know, get started with branding and also um, you know, do things like marketing online, um, you know, email marketing, all sorts of different stuff. Um, so that's a really, really great page for you to check out. And finally, uh, the last page I wanted to leave you with is the design school page. So if you go to designschool.canva.com, that's where you can see all of the content that me and my team work on. And there's lots of different courses and tutorials and all sorts of things um, to help you get started with all sorts of different design specialties, um, which is really cool. So um, with that, I'm going to open it up to Q&A and I'm sure you're all sick of the sound of my voice as I am. So um, hopefully if Marion is there, she can um, read out some of your questions. Thanks so much for listening. Okay, hi everyone. Thank you, Nick, that was fantastic. Um, I know that uh, we, we use Canva here at the library and uh, Melanie, Melanie and I have been watching and learning a lot. So. Uh, Hopefully for all of our library users, you'll be seeing some uh, excellent things on our Facebook page now that we've learned all this uh, new, new ways to use Canva. So um, yeah, fantastic. And we've been enjoying everyone's comments in the Q&A as well. So, so thank you very much for, for posting and uh, being part of that. I can see a lot of thank yous in there at the moment to Nick. So um, yes, a, a massive thank you to Nick. Um, if anyone has any questions, if you want to pop them in the Q&A and uh, we'll... Uh, see if uh, Nick can answer them for us. Oh, um, we did have one question earlier. Um, yeah. Uh, just about someone missed uh, how to find some of the uh, text, uh, uh, um, some of the font information. Are, are you able to maybe just point out where that they'd find that again? Yeah. So um, do you mean within, it was within the editor, like working with fonts in Canva? I think that might have been. Let me just pull it up. She just said, uh, Emma's just said, I missed how to search for font. Where to go? Oh, okay. To search for fonts, yes. Um, yes. I can very quickly show you now. Let me just um, share my screen again. Um, well, I might have shared the wrong one. Let me just do that again. Hmm. Okay. 
Um, so uh, coming back to the Canva editor here, I'm just going to add a new page into one of my documents. Um, so obviously you need to choose a template or start with a blank page to get into the Canva editor first. Uh, once you're in here, um, you can add text to your page. There's a handy little shortcut. If you just press the letter T on your keyboard, um, that'll add a paragraph of text to your page. Um, and you can see here, it's actually using the font that um, I last used um, in my previous design up here. Um, but you can see up in the toolbar, there is a font switcher. So um, just over on the toolbar on the left, that's where you can search for fonts and find all of the fonts that are in our library. Uh, so some of them are for pro users only, uh, which is the subs subscription product, um, but a lot of them are also free, free to use. Um, so that's where you can find them. Um, also, just try searching um, for keywords. So we have a lot of um, tagging going on. So you can search based on, I guess, like feeling. Um, so, you know, modern or happy or, um, I don't know, <laughs> scary. Oh, that's great. Um, yeah. <laughs> cool. Hopefully that answers uh, your question. Yeah, I think so. Um, and that's great to know that you can search by uh, a mood as well. Uh, that's, yeah, definitely definitely something fun to try. Um, all right, let's just see if we've got any other questions coming up. Um, mostly had some lovely comments. Um, Kata said she's completely new to Canva and can't wait to explore, so that's fantastic. Um, if anyone does have any other uh, questions on their mind, now is, uh, now is the time to ask. But otherwise, we've got a, a lot of thank yous. <laughs> Um, yeah, that's that's all good. It looks like I. <laughs> <laughs> You've obviously answered everyone. all of them. <laughs> um, and I believe Canva has um, some more tutorials on YouTube as well. Is that right? Yeah, we do. Um, so all of the uh, stuff you see on Design School is also on our YouTube channel. Um, but we have uh, a pretty big, uh, thriving community um, on YouTube. Um, so you can actually find. Let me just bring it up real quick because it's uh, worth having a look at. Great, thank you. Mm. Uh, so we have um, all of our tutorials from uh, our community on here. So we have uh, the CCCs, which are our Canva certified creatives. Um, and they make all sorts of interesting uh, ways of using Canva for, uh, they're, they're all business owners. So they all have their own independent um, businesses and they quite often talk about how they use Canva to, I guess, uh, enhance um, the work that they do. Um, we also have some really great content here, um, you know, like our One for All series, sort of like looking at different industries and inspirational content um, to help you get a better idea of design trends and that sort of thing. Um, yeah, there's always content coming out almost every day on the YouTube channel. So subscribe and check it out. Fantastic. Um, and for those who are asking as well, we've had a few questions about this session tonight. So we, we have filmed this session um, and we'll be editing this to go up on the Hornsby um, Shy Council YouTube channel as well. So um, if you missed anything or if you just want to watch it again, then um, that'll be coming up as well and we'll, we'll send the link out to people. Um, we've had a couple of questions about uh, fonts. Uh, so we've got one question about uh, what's a good font to use. So I don't know if that's sort of, if you have a favorite font that you want to suggest and uh, also one about font size. So I <laughs> don't know if you have a favorite font in Canva. <laughs> um, wow, uh, that is a good question. <laughs> I, I, good question. I don't have a, yeah, I don't have a favorite font, but um, uh, obviously I think, uh, you know, my background is in branding and, you know, I've worked on probably hundreds of brands and, um, I guess you always learn to leave your personal preference at the door uh, when you're designing. Um, you know, we're really always designing for an audience. So um, any kind of, yeah, I guess personal preference is usually not relevant. Um, so yeah, it really just completely depends on what I'm trying to communicate within, um, within the brand and, and what kind of audience I'm trying to get to. Uh, one, one really cool resource that I can share that's beyond uh, Canva uh, is... I think it's called type wolf um this is a it's just one guy he has a, a type blog i think he's in new york and he basically just trolls the internet looking for really interesting type trends and um he you can find really nice pairs and, and um 
discover some really nice type foundries, which are essentially um, design studios that focus just on typography. Um, and if you find a type that you really like, quite often he will tell you what similar fonts uh, match. So in the example of this one, uh, Luzanne uh, also matches uh, similar fonts, Folio and Helvetica now. Um, so you can, um, you can usually find a free version or, or a font that closely resembles the one that you want that's maybe a paid font um, by using you know, sites like Typewolf. Um, it's a really, really great resource. Yeah, that sounds great. Yeah. For, for any font fans out there, and um, seems like a good place to, to check. Um, we do have one question uh, coming in from Emma, and she's asked, if I create pages on Canva, can I save as a PowerPoint for presentation? Very, very good question. And I don't know how much I can tell you without revealing uh, our product roadmap. Um, <laughs> um, <laughs> look, I, I can tell you that I, I don't think it's available yet, but it's definitely coming. Um, it's something that our product um, engineers are working on at the moment. So you'll be able to export as a PowerPoint file. Um, however, I would highly discourage you from doing that because presenting directly from Canva is just so much better. It's honestly, yeah, it's, it's really full featured and awesome and you can do it obviously on any device. So it's really cool. Great. Oh, that's good. There's a couple of options then. So uh, yeah. <laughs> presenting in Canva and I guess also we'll uh, see, see what the future holds. <laughs> um, all right. If anyone has uh, any other questions, uh, then... Now is the time, I think. It looks like we've covered most of them. Looks like it's just a, a lot of thank yous coming through. So um, I, I guess uh, from all of us at Hornsby Library and, and from everyone in the, the Q&A, it seems, thank you so much, Nick. This has uh, been fantastic. I think we've all definitely learned a lot. <laughs> Yeah, it's my pleasure. No, thanks so much for having me. I uh, really appreciate it. And obviously, if anyone does have any more questions, um, I did say to Marion that um, I, you know, you can you can definitely reach out to me. Um, and I'm sure Marion can even forward <laughs> your questions onto me. I'm happy to help out. We have lots of other resources in our kind of orbits that I can share with you um, if you have any specific concerns or you want support with anything. Um, but yeah, I wish you all the best luck with your businesses, and hopefully, you got something out of today's workshop. Fantastic. Thank you so much to, um, to everyone for coming along tonight and, and a big thank you to Nick. Um, if, if you do have any uh, questions, I suppose, that you, you didn't want to ask tonight, you can always uh, send them on to us at uh, Hornsby Library and we'll pass them on if we can. Um, and uh, as we said, we've, we've recorded tonight, so we'll uh, make that available to everyone. But uh, a big, big thank you to Nick. And uh, with that, I guess we'll say good night. So good night, everyone, and thank you. <laughs>